Being the pioneer researchers, we thrive on new angles to catch the attention of young conservationists. Before moving on to the webinar, I would like to inform you that we will be having a question and answer session at the end of the talk. So please be patient and post your questions in the chat box. Also, please uh, feel free to use the hand raise option. I repeat, kindly wait till the end to post your question, questions in the chat box. Without further ado, I now request Additional Principal Chief Conservator of Forests and Director through A. Udayan IFS to start this webinar by showing some light on the topic. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Divinia. Uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, once again associated with uh, another uh, talk. I think uh, many of you may be aware that uh, the Advanced Institute for Wildlife Conservation has started a series of talks on uh, especially those species on which uh, we really do not know much about. Because uh, some of the charismatic species, flagship species, there's lots to uh, read, there's lots of literature available. Uh, but uh, certain other species, um, not much work has happened and very few people have worked on these uh, taxa or species and we would like to focus on this so that uh, especially the forest department staff get to know more about uh, these species and uh, they take into account in their day-to-day -day management of the habitat uh, they are in charge of. So today I think um, we are having Dr. Srihari Raman talking about bats in the Western Ghats. Uh, very, very important species, uh, tropical species by nature. Of course, we do have some of them in the uh, other areas also. Uh, but um, we know they are there, but we do not know much about them. Um, and uh, for me, it was a little uh, surprising that about 20 species, 20% 20 of all mammal species are bats, uh, which is a surprising uh, fact. Uh, after rodents, I think we have maximum number of bats as uh, mammalian species. And uh, um, we have several species in our country and um, their uh, way of uh, life and uh, their technology, I would say, the way, I don't know whether it's appropriate to use the word technology, at least the uh, mechanism by which they use to uh, locate as well as uh, move about. It's something where uh, I think scientific institutions uh, right across the world are trying to study and use it in our own uh, aircrafts and other things. So it's a very important uh, species as far as uh, moving technology is concerned. Mm, and uh, another thing is uh, when we do not know much about them or you don't see them often, you really do not know about their role they play also. So that is a uh, aspect we need to consider, enlighten ourselves about uh, these species, ensure that they are also conserved uh, because um, we have lost a lot of uh, bats in terms of the populations in many areas because of uh, losing their shelters, the caves or overhangs or the large trees in which they roost. We have lost many of them and thereby the bat uh, population gets affected also. So it will be very interesting to uh, learn more about these species which have a very uh, varied habitat requirements. Uh, some of them are insectivores, frugivores, uh, nectarivores, etc. And in terms of the sizes and things like that also, they, there's a huge variation. Western Ghats is endowed with a good uh, number of species. I'm sure uh, we'll get to know more about it. I expect it to be a very interesting session. And as I already mentioned, if you have any questions, any queries, please uh, put it in the chat box. It will all be uh, addressed towards the end of the uh, lecture. So thank you once again for, uh, uh, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, hopefully it will be a very, very interesting session. Thank you so much. Over to you, Lavinia. Thank you very much, sir, for the valuable insight. Now, I call upon scientist Dr. Shamir to introduce our speaker to enlighten us more on bats. Good afternoon, everyone. Our guest speaker, Mr. Sriharir Raman, has done his graduation in forestry and post-graduation 
in wildlife sciences from Kerala Agricultural University. He has received his doctor fellowship from Chinese Academy of Sciences. Also worked as an ecologist in Peria Tiger Reserve and currently working as an assistant professor at KAU. He has more than 10 years of research experience on taxonomy, biogeography, bioacoustics, and niche modeling of bats of Western Guards. He has published around 16 research articles in peer-reviewed journals. Apart from his research, he is also a dedicated wildlife educator. He has conducted several outreach and awareness programs across the state of Kerala and was awarded the prestigious Chandrasekharan Memorial Award for his contribution towards biodiversity conservation in 2021. It gives me immense pleasure to call upon our esteemed speaker, Mr. Sri Hari Raman, one of my close friends and a great biologist to take over this webinar. I welcome you on behalf of all the AWC family to this session. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Good afternoon, all. Uh, thank you, Dr. Samir, for the wonderful uh, introduction, as well as Director AWC for this wonderful opportunity to present uh, at AWC online platform. So today, um, I'm going to throw some light on the batch ecology and the taxonomy of the bats that are seen in the Western Guards. <coughs> So as our director sir was rightly pointed out, like the second largest order of mammals after rodents, considering around 21 percentage. That's in the globally. But when it comes to the Western Guards, they are outnumbering the rodents. That means they constitute more than 42 percentage of the entire mammalian diversity. And it's true for the state of Tamil Nadu as well as Kerala. And going to the bat richness, you can see like the bats are mostly concentrated along the tropical regions and especially the, the South America, the part of Southeast Asia. But if you look at the map and see the, the Indian plate tube, we have like the bad diversity is a bit lower when compared to the other tropical region. There are several reasons for that. So if you go back to the evolution, the bats are said to evolve somewhere around like 60 million years ago. And that 65 million years ago is said to have the fifth mass extinction happens. And Followed by the kickstart of the, the era of uh, the Cenozoic era, which is also known as the age of mammals. And the time period that 65 million years ago, the position of the India was actually an island that got already detached from the Gondwana land. Gondwana, the mainland Gondwana land, and it was like floating in the, in the thesis. And finally, around 50 million years ago, it got hit with the Laurasian plate. And what happened is all those bats that got diversified during this period slowly started colonizing, started slowly started colonizing from the Southeast Asia towards Indian plateau. And there are several theories that support the, the, the taxa movement from Southeast Asia. The, one of the common uh, theory that we are like saying is the, the Sakura hypothesis, that which means the Vindya Sakura mountain ranges in the central India, which act as a corridor for the movement of the species from. Uh, the Southeast Asia or the Malayan region towards the Western Ghats and eventually reached the, the Sri Lanka. There are also several studies that says like Eastern Ghats act, act as a corridor and few studies also point out the importance of the Aravallis for the taxa movement. And this is one species which I recorded in 2020 from uh, Western Ghats. Like first initially I thought it was a completely new species but we did the phylogeny and we, we found that this is a species which having a close relation with this, the one that is distributed in the Laos region. And this particular genus was the first of this kind from Indian plate. And, and, and during the time of diversification, most of the species that seen at present in the India are like very much close from the Southeast Asia and, fus, and very few species that are, you know, close relation with the, uh, the Middle Eastern region. And, and that is one of the reasons that, that we have like less number of species diversity or species richness in India. All the species has, you know, moved from the Southeast Asia or the Middle East towards the India. And coming to the, the taxonomy that like the entire bat family is divided into 21 different families, 
of which nine are represented in India. And among the nine, we have like, uh, we have like two species that are listed in the Wildlife Protection Act. One is the Latin Salimeli, or the Salimeli's fruit bat, and second is the, it's an insectivorous bat, which is known as the Rogotan spree tail bat. And among the, the remaining, all the species are either listed as vermins, like all the other remaining fruit bats are listed as the vermins, and some of the other species are not even listed in the Wildlife Protection Act. And out of the 1,400 plus species that is so far organized from the globally, we had like 63 species are, are reported from the Western Guards. And very, very recently, last month, there is one more species that is described from the Southern Western Guards and Sri Lanka. So we have like almost like 64 plus one, we have like six, sorry, 63 plus one, we have now 64 species in the stain guards, including uh, the entire South India. So coming to the morphology of the bats, um, this is the, this shows like the how diversity is. We can see like two gram bats weighing like two grams to 1.2 grams, kilo, sorry, 1.2 kilogram body weight. That means like the wingspan of 17 centimeter. Okay. Okay. Participants kindly unmute. Sorry, you kindly mute your mic. Okay, the morphology itself says like some of the bat species. The, the, the smallest one that ever recorded is the is the kitty's hognose bat that's seen in the Myanmar and Thailand, which having a weight of two grams. And the one, the biggest one, is from the Philippines, which having like wingspan of one seventy, that one point seven meters, having a weight of one point two kilograms. And coming to the Indian scenario, we have the the largest one is like having a one one point two meter wingspan and weighing something around uh, one kilogram. And the, the smallest one is like having the three gram, the least purpose clay. So, so this is how diverse the bat is. And coming to the general physiology, as I said, like uh, here there are general notes like they are nocturnal, but it's not completely nocturnal. Some of those bat species you can see in the early morning, some of the bat species that you can see in the dawn and the dusk, that means evening. And some are, you know, some of the bat species that come out of their roost only at complete darkness. So the, it varies between species to species. And the second socially, like maybe you may be aware of the, the large fruiting trees, the large fruit bed that's hanging in the big, uh, large standing trees. But, but there are also several other species that roost solitary or in pairs or in very small groups. So like in generally we can say like the bats are usually social animals uh, seen in small groups or two, uh, like groups of like even thousands or millions. And coming to the reproduction, they usually give birth to one pup, but for some species, they will give birth to twins or they have two breeding season in a year. It's also varies between species. And coming to the longevity, you can see like uh, a four gram body weight of a bat species, a bat species having four gram body weight can live for more than 40 years. So the longevity is pretty high. And because of its longevity, its, its daily activity pattern, they have a good immune system, which make them as a natural reservoir of many pathogen, many, many disease causing organisms. Coming to the roasting site. So suppose a single tree is standing there. So can you imagine which of the part of this uh, trees are used by these bats? The one you might be aware of the large fruiting, uh, fruit bat, which is hanging on the branches, the Tyropus medius. But there are very um, other insectivorous bats. They use the bark, bark of a single tree for roosting. They may be usually roosting in solitary or in pairs. Some, some use some of the knots or some tree holes there. Some can use some cracks or split in the bark. Some use the dry foliages. So, so you can even imagine like one, in a one single tree, we can have like more than like five to six species can be roosting in a single tree. The other important roosting site of the bats are the caves. There are several subterranean species. They need complete darkness and the caves are also producing, also providing a important habitat for the roosting. Cave roosting bats, some uses tunnels, some uses some uh, tree huts, tree top huts, some of the abandoned buildings and even the attics of some of the houses where some of the uh, preferred roosting site of bats. Coming to the feeding pattern. Majority, majority of the bat species are said to be feeds on, uh, feeding on the insects. So insectivorous bat, then followed by the frugivorous bat. Then some are like feeding on the pollens or the nectar. And the next one, you may be familiar about the vampire bats that feeds on the blood. 
and some are like adapted for catching fishes having very long lengthy claws so that uh, they can easily uh, scoop along the water in the flow of the direction of the water and can catch the fish some are you know known to feed on terrestrial small vertebrates like the frogs some skinks uh, and some small, small reptiles and some are known to be omnivores so and each group of uh, bats are also playing an important role in uh, in the in keeping the balance of the ecosystem for example the one of the insectivorous bat they act as uh, insect controllers especially they are uh, they are known to control some of the zoonotic diseases like the malaria and zika they are like uh, the the mosquitoes or some of the fleas are known to be the vectors of such diseases so the insectivorous bat act as a controlling agent second is the fruit they are said to be a seed dispersal as you know like similarly the play the role played by the birds uh, consuming the birds from one part of the forest and they are like defecating in another another region thereby increasing the seed dispersal nectar pollen of course they are not known to be a pollinators the blood bat pa that's a protein that can be uh, that is isolated from the saliva of the blood sucking bat which is similar to that of uh, the leeches and such bat protein pa can be widely used in medical science for uh, for uh, manufacturing of several medicines for that control the blood clotting and stroke so i want to tell you a little bit more about the blood sucking bats or the vampire bats that they are like very small bats having a weight of 5 grams and they are seen only in south and central america and they feed primarily on the blood of domestic animals especially the cattle as well as the birds and as i said the protein that is isolated from the from the uh, saliva is uh, useful for the medical science and which is 20 times more specific than any other substance for so far available for dissolving the clots and based on the the food diet or the diet the mouth the facial pattern of the bats also varies for example the first one having a very lengthy snout so you can you can can you guess like uh, what kind of food they are feeding with a long lengthy snout they are like yeah they are mostly you know nectar feeders the second one is the fruit eaters the third one is having a uh, having a very sharp pointed teeth and they are minute bats having some kind of structures in the ears so they are like mostly insectivores and there are there are several species of uh, plants which are you know pollinated only by bats for example the durian the durian uh, which is very famous for the manufacture of the tequila and that particular fruits is pollinated primarily by the bats durian is another classical example where it is like pollinated through bats and it is widely cultivated in part of southeast asia now it is available in part of india and sri lanka second is uh, they are integral part of food chain they are being eaten by other large birds or carnivores for example the birds the reptiles even frogs or even spiders so they being an integral part of ecosystem being eaten by other uh, other large vertebrates or invertebrates maintaining the balance of the ecosystem the bat guano the guano is the terminology for the fecal matter of both bats as well as birds and this this guano is uh, rich in phosphorus as well as sulfur so it is widely used or extracted as natural fertilizers and this is a picture from thailand where they used to excavate this guano from large caves and marketing it in the among the farmer farming communities then coming to the ecolocation this is one of the interesting stuff and we have like the bats as i said before we have like fruit eating bats as well as insect eating bats in our south india and the coming to the fruit eating bat they usually have a very big eyes and that gives you gives them a very good vision similar to the nocturnal animals excuse me
Okay, sorry for the technical hinge. Okay, so the echolocation. Echolocation is nothing but they used to produce ultra high frequency echolocation sound for communication, for detecting their path and detecting the prey. And there are like few other species, they don't echolocate, uh, echolocate. instead they have very good uh, vision of sight and, and they, they, they find their prey as well as uh, the path, unlike on any other nocturnal mammals. So the echolocating bird, they produce echolocation sound, which is inaudible to the humans. That means more than 20 kilohertz, uh, kilohertz frequency. And there, there are two types. One is the laryngeal echolocation, and which is some of the bats they emit through their nostrils and they receive their echolocation sound after the emitted echolocation sound will be received and they find the prey. The second is they detect the sounds, uh, the sounds that is produced by some of the insects like the crickets or the quacking sound of the fox. And after listening to that, they will go and catch the prey. And, and the, the, there are several groups. The first one is a purely a fruit bat. You can see very big eyes. So they have a very good vision. They don't echolocate usually. But the second group is having a kind of facial structures. So they used to send their echolocation calls through their nostrils. The third one, they doesn't have any facial pattern and they used to emit their calls through their mouth. So the one that is not producing true laryngeal echolocation, but still they produce a small kind of feeble echolocation call using their tongue clicks or the wing clappings. And the, the, call, the, the kind of echolocation call that they produce also varies between the species. For example, the one that is uh, flying in the open spaces, they, ha they have to send their echolocation call for a very long distance. So they produce very low frequency. But in the case of the one that is seen in the highly cluttered habitat, they produce very high frequency echolocation. And the one that is, that is flying, that is using the edge, they produce intermediate kind of frequency. And, and the one, the open space feeders, they prefer to feed on large bodied size prey. And the one in the narrow will be preferring a very small size prey. And if you record the echolocation call, we can see the patterns of the, the characteristic features of this each call and, and which is unique for each family. For example, the one, this having a very constant, uh, this, uh, this, is, this part is known as the frequency modulated and this is known as the constant frequency. This is again, FM component. So FM CF component is unique for one particular group of bats. This is only CF and the FM component, which is again unique for another family. So by looking at the echolocation call, we can easily identify the species or the family. This is the one that we uh, recently published where I put all the echolocation calls of the bat, uh, of the insectivorous bats in the wrestling cards. You can see this constant frequency bat and all, and each of these calls are unique. That means the echolocation calls of the Rhinolophus rooks is somewhere around 80. The one of the pusilus is something around 100 kilohertz. So it varies between species to species. And, and, and this is another group of bats where they produce only the frequency modulated uh, echolocation calls. And here they can find several other species which they produce multi-harmonic echolocation calls. So this is also a unique uh, novel technique for the species level identification, just like our fingerprint. So the, the human fingerprint, which is unique for each person, similar to the, the pattern, the stripe patterns in tiger, similar to the song, bird songs, and similar to the vocalization in urine. Similarly, for the identification of the bats, it's so easy to uh, record the echolocation sound and identify the species. And for that, as I said, like these echolocation codes are inaudible for the humans. So we need some equipment, for example, the bat detectors, so that it can record, it can, uh, it can convert this high frequency echolocation call to human audible range, and we can extract the frequency level. So this, I just want to point out here because these are some of the old techniques that we adopted or we used in early days for collecting bats. One of the uh, common one was the misnet. This is widely used for collecting birds and bats. But what's the problem is that once the bat got entangled, it will eventually, it will lead to the death of bats. And recently I visited a couple of museums what I, I was like shocked after seeing like several bats, like more than like 90% of the bat species that are preserved there belongs to the fruit bats because the fruit bats are mainly trapped in kind of misnets. 
And recently, the scientists also come up with new trapping techniques, which is known as the hop traps, which is uh, which is an easy way to trap the insectivorous bat, where uh, having a very little stress for the animals. For example, uh, in this picture, there are like a series of parallel fishing lines are passing here. So once the bat passes through this trap, it gets scooped and collected in the bag attached at the bottom. And the bats can easily hang inside so that uh, once we open the bag, bat can easily fly away. Without damaging the bats, we can collect the, uh, we, can, we can take pictures and we can record the echolocation sound and we can leave it. The third, and nowadays the scientists are also using equipments like the bat lure, which can play back the sound of bats and attract species. Radio tagging is again, these days are very common. Previously, like um, radio tagging was not possible for small bodied animals because of, uh, because of the lack of uh, like uh, the such sophisticated equipments. For example, as a thumb, thumb roll will say like less than 10% of the body weight of the animal should be the weight of this radio tag. So, so for example, five, five gram body weight of a bat, that means we need like, uh, 0.5 gram weight of a radio tag, which is not available like a few years back, but nowadays it's all you know, available in the market. The next is the thermal cameras, which is also useful for detecting bats. Chiroptocopter, this is again uh, equipment that can fly, like similar to the drones, we can uh, attach the bat detectors and fly at what height these bats are flying. Then what are the major conservation challenges facing by the bats? We don't have proper sampling techniques. We don't have proper identification keys. We don't have a regional echo band. As I said, like the echo location sound. Once we have this library of the, all the bat species, we can easily identify the species. The lack of financial aid, because once uh, like uh, no one wants to fund for bat research these days. Otherwise, previously, if you send some uh, the proposal for like other mammals, there's high chance for getting. But if we write some proposal for the bats, no one will care about it. And difficulty in getting study permits. That's again, like one of the challenges that I faced during my studies. And why the people are like scared of this bat? Nipah, of course, in Kerala, like a couple of years back, there was like Nipah outbreak and few people died. And the recent study from the Kerala part also says that there are 14 different species that are said to be potential Nipah carriers, 14 species. Similarly, all the species are also seen in South India, including Tamil Nadu. And the disease like white nose syndrome. So we said like uh, bats are the potential carriers of several diseases. At the same time, the bats are also susceptible to some of the disease like the white nose syndrome. This is very common in species that are hibernating. So we are in the tropical country, so we don't have like uh, having, uh, there is no report of the white nose syndrome from the Kerala or the South India, but there are like uh, hibernating bats in the Himalayan region. So of course, this kind of disease is prevailing in this hibernating bats in Himalayas. Another emerging threat is the windmills. So in many of the developed countries, before installing the windmill, they will do a acoustic surveys and say like, and they identify places where there is least activity of the bats and lay the windmills. But but in South India, like uh, people are like don't ca care about the activity of the birds, activity of the birds or the bats, and before installing the windmills. Another emerging threat in South India or across globally is the cave tourism. These days, like uh, there are many ecotourism points where they are like uh, opening the caves for tourism. And which again, like uh, disturbing the roosting size of many of the species. Taxidermy, this is again uh, available in the market. This, for example, this particular species, which is known as the painted bat, which is very common in the fringe areas, especially in Tamil Nadu, Kerala side. And it was a least concerned species as per IUCN, but recently it is elevated, elevated to near threatened because this particular species is widely hunted, mainly for taxidermy purposes and as well as for developing the paperweight. Hunting, the hunting for bat, mainly for protein, for medicines, as well as for fun. So the several indigenous group of people, they still believe like bat can be used for the treatment of uh, disease like the asthma. And many of the underdeveloped countries or even developing countries, they use this bat meat as a source of protein. And these are said to be the, you know, uh, uh, point of the place of uh, the set to be the 
the reason our Ebola outbreak in Africa was said to be from a, from a bat that is consumed. Then another emerging threat is the uh, climate change. So this is a study recently published. And here we projected the potential impact of the climate change on the endemic and the endangered saturated cell in Mali as we, we found that majority of the suitable habitat will vanish by the end of this century. And, and there was also a recent study saying that the Tyropos medius or the large flying fox, which is roosting in the large standing trees and unavailability of the large standing trees also posing severe threat to the Tyropos medius, which is one of the potential NIPA carrier. So these species will be under stress and, and there's a high chance of spillover. And there are like several um, NGOs or organizations across the globe for the conservation of bats. And we also like part of it and we are like um, developing models for identifying the potential suitable habitat, the important bat uh, hotspots. And this is uh, from our recent publication where we identified the potential bat hotspots in Southern West Bengal region. And we found like the region from Pedia landscape to Agastimala are you know, having more number of bats when compared to the other regions in South India. And we again tried to see like how much uh, area of each species, I mean, suitable area of each species is protected, which we found like we are also shocking, like more than 50 percentage of the suitable area remain unprotected. That means outside protected area network, which again pose severe threat to the bat fauna. Coming to the funding agencies, like have you ever noticed the logo in a Bacardi? Uh, maybe Bacardi is very common for everyone, familiar for most of you, like uh, its, it's logo is a bat. And there is a funny story behind this. The first distillery unit of the Bacardi where they started having a roost of bat, a philostomida bat. And, and they got a lot of revenue out of their distillery. And they thought like the, the roosting of the bat uh, make, brings the fortune. So finally they, they used this bat as their logo of Bacardi and every year, and every year they are donating millions of rupees for, for the bat conservation. And there are a few other opportunities like for the researchers or the scientists, there are like uh, many opportunities for conducting bioacoustic surveys, one of the easiest way for studying the bats, uh, producing regional echo banks or the field cover, field guides. Then coming to the uh, protective area managers, increasing tree cover is one of the key uh, mitigation measures for the uh, for uh, for mitigating the climate impact of climate change on such species and this can be done through either for either in the um, degraded land or along the farm border by through agroforestry systems and uh, and there are some of the new species for the scientists there also you know the molecular taxonomy is developing and some of the species that we pre previously thought are subspecies or could be a new species. The, one of the classical example is the one that described last month, which we previously thought with that species has dis distributed throughout India and Southeast Asia. But now the scientists say like the one that is seen in South India is, is completely different one and the other, the Southeast Asia is completely different one. So there are like a lot of opportunities for the scientists as well as the protected area managers for bat conservation. So coming to the bat taxonomy, it's so easy. Like we have only 64 species. So I will quickly go through how to identify a bat. As I said, these mammals, the bats are flying mammals, similar to the human. They are like five fingers, the thumb, second and third is actually fused with the, the fourth one and the fifth one. The wing is also known as the patagium and they have a tail. It's not true for, true for all the species. Some having a very short tail, some doesn't have tail and they have the tail member. If they have a tail, they usually have a tail member. And for each family, we have only nine family and each family members having unique facial characters as well as uh, tail characters. The fruit bats having, of course, have a very big eyes and they don't have any facial, uh, the no sleeve kind of structures. But in the case of Rhinolophidae, Depositidae and remaining most of the family, they have kind of complex facial pattern. The tail pattern of each family is also different. For the example, the fruit bats, they have you know, very short tail and for one or two species, they lack tail. Some having a very long lengthy tail, just like a rodent. 
some has tail that is uh, held inside the tail and which will be freely floating from the from the edge of the or the tip of the uropatagium that means the the tail membrane some they come up protruding in the midway from the tail membrane so it varies between the family to family so once you have the bat in your hand you can just simply look at the tail or the face so that you can easily identify uh, the family as well as the genus so this is a fruit bat um, so i'm not going to so coming to salimeli fruit bat so again like it is a only species of fruit bat that is listed in the wildlife protection act so identifying the the salimeli fruit bat is a bit tricky it's it's similar to the other fruit other other fruit bats like the cynopterus sphinx or the brachiotis but in the case of salimeli fruit bat they have only one pair of incisors in the uh, upper and the lower jaw but in the case of other fruit bat they have like two pairs that means they have four incisors in the upper and the lower jaw so this is the one key character of salimeli fruit bat and they doesn't have any tail they are roosting in small numbers that means 800 to sorry sorry one uh, 200 to 400 numbers in caves that too in a high elevated african forest uh, there are other cave dwelling species this is again uh, uh, rosetus leshnauti uh, this is uh, roosting in large numbers they they are also used as some abandoned building for roosting So coming to the second family, Megaderma today, which is having a very big oval ears. So there are only two species under this family, but uh, based on the ecology, we can easily identify because the one is a drysone species and second one and drysone species, which is roost in large numbers. The second one is again seen in drysone as well as in evergreen forest, but they roost in very small numbers, like in very few, like sometimes solitary or sometimes in group of like 10 to 15. So based on the ecology, based on the roosting structure, we can identify. Otherwise, you need to look very close, look at the, the nozzle, nozzle, nozzle structures, which is pretty long in the case of Lyra and which is small in the case of Spasma. A third group is the uh, horseshoe bat. That means they have you know a horseshoe-like patterns in the nozzle. And for those, for, for the rhinolophid species, we need to look into the the, the cella or the forward projecting structure and which also varies in the shape and the size. So we should have a, a close-up image of from the from the lateral side for clear-cut identification of the species. See that this is the some of the Rhinelophid species. You can see the, the shape varies as well as the color is also varying. The shape varies We're having a having a pointed one. Here it is the notch is completely different. Here it is different. But the color is not an identification character. This, uh, the color may varies depending on the season, depending on the roosting site. Then the another family is the is the leaf nose bat, which identification is again more tricky. We have to look very close into the the lateral leaflets on either side of the uh, either side of the nose. For example. This is one species, they are having only one lateral leaflet, but in the case of this species, they have two, this having three and this having four. So only having a plus of images of such a region, uh, we can easily identify the species. And there is also a few species which doesn't have a lateral leaflet. In such case, we need to have to look into the internal septum, the middle region. So the shape is also unique for each species which we need to have a close-up image for species level identification. And the next group is, uh, again, which is also known as the sheath tail bat or tom bat or pouch bearing bat. You can see the tail is uh, embedded within the tail membrane and it will protrude it outside from the midway. Somewhere in the midway, it protrude it outside. In such case, we need to look into the, uh, there's a pouch in the, this is the thumb, second, third, fourth, and fifth. Between the four, four, forearm and the fifth, there is a pouch. So we need to look into such characters for the identification. Then the next family is, uh, which is also known as the mouse tail bat or rhinophomatidae, which having a very lengthy tail, a mouse-like tail. And there are only two species and which can be easily identified based on uh, ocular estimation of the tail length and the the forearm length. If the tail length is more than the forearm length, it is one species. And if it is vice versa, it's completely. There are only two species. 
and this is again rhizome species we can see only in in caves and in northern part of western ghats molasidae is another group uh, again the tail is like it's also say free tail bat that means the the tail is embedded in the uropatagium and which is uh, which is again um, like freely from the from the tip of the uropatagium and they are also known as the brindle lip bat because um, their lips are look like uh, uh, their lips are totally brindled so it's also known as the brindle lip bats or free tail bats again then this is one of the biggest family bat family which is known as the vespertidionidae or evening family or vesper bats and such species can be uh, first we need to go for this genus level in this case we have to look in the ears and there are like structures within the ear which is known as the tragus the shape of the tragus varies between genus so first we need to identify the genus based on their tragus the tragus is unique for each genus and this is first one which having a spear shaped tragus and they have a very lengthy claws and the myotis genus is also adapted for catching the fishes the second is having a pointed shape tragus this is the one that we are talking before like painted bat very beautiful bat this is the one that we recently collected from west bengal as i said like the first record from india and all those kerivala the phoniscus all having pointed kind of structures there is another house bat yellow house bat they having like forward projecting the tragus is forward projecting uh, the next group is having a completely different kind of tragus it's either straight or slightly curved back backward they have like it's also characterized by a tubular nose which is also known as tube nose bat the nose is uh, the nose is kind of tubular structure then again there is an, another interesting group of bat that that used to roost uh, roost in the roost in the bamboos so for for such adaptation such the skull of the bamboo bats are usually flattened so that it's make easy for the bamboo bats to 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 pass through some of the small uh um, small holes or small slits in the bamboo clumps and roost inside they are also adapted with sticky uh, thumbs and the pad it's seen both in the for uh, in the thumb region as well as in the toes which allow them to stick inside the bamboo clumps so th this is such adaptations for the bamboo bats then there are like uh, pipistrellus bat as i said this, this is the smallest one pipistrellus coromandra and the tenuis they are both are the smallest one seen in indian subcontinent and weighing something around 3 grams of weight you can see like how the this is an adult bat that's sitting in my finger so this is the smallest one here having it's very very difficult to identify that both the tenuis and the coromandra and uh, this again pipistrellus group pipistrellus group then come to the final last family which is known as the minyopteridae it's also known as the long fingered bat you can see that the one of the finger is pretty long when compared to the remaining rest of the fingers so it's a, that's why it's known as the long fingered bat and there are like couple of species here but the one that recently described from recently described from the sri lanka south india is belong to this particular family minyopteridae and they are purely evergreen species and uh, they roost in large numbers in said caves mostly they prefer to roost in caves they are minyopteridae so this is all about the taxonomy um i think uh, we can move to the question and we will have more discussion on that thank you sir for the valuable information it was a very good presentation uh now we request the participants to kindly post your questions in the chat box i repeat kindly post your questions in the chat box also feel free to unmute yourself to ask ask the questions yourself thank you
Okay, regarding the mutualistic interaction between the bats and specific plant species, yes, of course, there are like several interactions and some of the bat species are like roosting in specific plants. For example, the Kerivola picta, the painted bat, they used to prefer to roost on the banana leaves, both the dry leaves as well as the young tender leaves. And there are like Kerivola, other species of Kerivola that are said to roost inside the uh, inside the pitcher plants. So the interactions are there. Uh, how many in insectivorous bat species are there in India? Uh, the numbers keep on changing. Like, uh, as I said, like there are like uh, nearly 160, 170 species somewhere in India. Uh, the number is given there. And only like a small portion is the fruit bats. Remaining the majority, 90% of the bats are insectivorous. And we have like few omnivore species or carnivore species that feeds on uh, on that feeds on the frogs or the reptiles. Why do bats hang up, upside down? So the bats got evolved like around 65 million years ago, and it's uh, like evolutionary characteristics, and as well as it, one the bats are hanging. So once they release their uh, their legs, it's easy for them to take the flight. So they don't have a well-developed uh, limbs, uh, hind limbs, so as to take flight from the ground. So once they're hanging, it's easy for them to you know, take the flight. That is one of the evolutionary characteristics of the bat. Uh, so Mr. Gokul S asks, why do bats hang upside down? Okay, I was explaining that. Uh, I should I explain again? So I think- We'll move on to the next question. Okay, yeah. Oops. Okay. Um, what make you can ask? Uh, Ms. Aparna Srinivas uh, has a question. What kind of fruit bats do we see in urban areas? Okay. So there are like several species of bats. If I say like even the even the Chennai city, you can have at least like ten to twelve species of bat. So it's very difficult to say which species uh, that you are like talking about, but there are two species that are two species of fruit bats, which is widely common in urban area and the remaining 10 species are insectivores mostly. So they can usually roost in some trees, some are roosting in the terrace, some of the attics, instead the clay tiles. So they, they can use any undisturbed places for their roosting. So from my study, I can select 10 to 15 species of bats are like adopted to highly urbanized cities. For exact species identification, you can or you can get one bat detector, record the calls and just send me, or you can you can uh, uh, compare with the frequency of the echolocation call that's already available in the internet. So you can identify the species. Aparna next one. Okay, so um, Ms. Aparna says on her terrace, she has seen bigger fruit bats and some smaller bats. She's, yes. uh, yeah, She's yeah that's what I said. Like the two species of fruit bats, you're like pretty common, pretty common in urban areas. Uh, Mr. Madeshwaran wants to know, uh, Sir, do you think there's a stigma around conservation of bats due to their tendency to be a carrier for certain diseases? Of course, yes. So, uh, bat conservation, like many people, uh, they don't want to, you know, work on such species. For example, in, in my side, my, my state, Kerala, only like very few people, like less than five people are currently working on bats when compared to the other taxa and, and not providing such uh, significant uh, data or significant result for exact conservation measures. So that is one of the challenging reasons. Is yes, what you said is right. Thank you, Madeshwaran. That was a good question. Uh, Mr. Hussein wants to know what are the effects of climate change on bats? Yeah, climate change has uh, two types of uh, impact on the bat distribution. So usually like um, 
as temperature increases, what happened is some of the forest dependent species, they tend to move to cooler region. For example, the bat that are distributed in the lower, uh, lower elevation, they tend to move to the high elevation. And for some of the dry zone species, that means the species that are seen in the cities or some degraded land, they, they, for such species, the, the potential distribution area will increase due to, due to the habitat degradation causes due to climate change. So for forest dependent species, the habitat will shrink and for the dry zone species, they will get a very good natural habitat in the coming years. So there are two kinds of impact. I, I already shown the impact of climate change on the endangered Latin Salimili. And we projected a modeling study says that by the end of the 21st century, the most of the suitable habitat will vanish. Thank you, Mr. Usai, for the question. We move on to the next question. Uh, the question is, uh, tell me percentage of sequence similarity between genome of human and bats. Oh, that's, I don't know, because I'm not working on the genetic aspects. Maybe some of the people who works, I don't know, someone is listening to the genetic aspect can answer to this question. Again, we are all mammals and the mammals, among the mammals, bats are one of the uh, group that got evolved like 65 million years ago, which is far, far away from the human evolution humans got evolved. So I think like, um, I think they are widely separated. That's what I can say. How to learn about bats, any course or training in bats? Um, like uh, for me, like uh, I started my career, uh, the bat research while I started my master's in wildlife sciences in Kerala Agriculture University, where I got a very little experience for sure on the bat taxonomy. From there, the only main, main reason I focused on bat is there is no specific studies. There are only less uh, you know, good images for the bats, less literature from other side, our side. So I thought of why can't I do a research or I should focus on such group. That's why uh, you know, the last 10 years I was behind these bats. So there is no courses. We, I already run a couple of other short courses on courses. Uh, and there is no specific, I don't know whether uh, any institution giving uh, training on such pets. But if you are interested, you can contact me. I can provide you all this data, all those uh, presentations. And that for the taxonomy, it's pretty easy. But these days, you know, bad detectors are available in the market, which is also you know, cheaper. You can collect it uh, and you can start recording the bats. The softwares are also free downloaded. You can analyze the calls and identify the bats. So this is the questions from Hussein Sheikh. The next is the question from the... Uh, Mr. Karufusami wants to know, is there any sanctuary available for exclusively conserving bat species in India or the world? Uh, in India, I don't think so. Um, but uh, what I say is, is there is one reserve forest in Kerala which is known as the Mankulam, which having the largest roosting site of Latitude Salimali. So now we, there is a proposal to, to elevate its conservation status to a wildlife sanctuary based on, uh, the, based on the presence of such roosting site. And in world, there are now outside many of the developed countries, they were left on top in a bad conservation. And there are like places for, uh, declared as bad reserves where the people can go there and record the acoustic calls and 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 do some uh, dis research on the bats in such regions. But for now, in India, there is no such sanctuary. But we, we have like few bird sanctuaries, but we don't have bat sanctuaries. Maybe in future we can expect to want. Thank you, sir. We'll move on to the next question. So Mr. Velasami wants to know, uh, kindly let me know the list of fruit bearing tree species mostly preferred by bats. Um, they are known to be like more than 150 species of plants that are preferred by the, by the fruit, fruit bats. The most of the common 
fruiting species that we see around us is like preferred by the bat species. If you want the more details on that, I can email you or you can send, you can share your phone number. I can send you there. Uh, there is a published record on the list of species. I can share that paper with you. You can, you can send your book. Is it possible? Okay. Okay, you can send your details here. Ah, okay, you can send your details. I can share that paper where the list of the preferred plant species are, are reported from the care from the South India. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hi, Dr. Uttam Saika. Happy to see you here. Okay, uh, a small addition, there will be a slight bump in the species count of India in India. There is like at least like 131 species. Probably you missed the another new species I discovered from Meghalaya in 2022. Oh, great. Oh, sorry, Uttam Saika. Like uh, this is a presentation I prepared last year. So yeah, I need to update this. Thank you for noting that. Hope you're doing well. Uh, question from Saravana, migration nature of bats and so list some of the Tamil Nadu, sir. So bat migration, like, so the migration of the bats is very common during in the temperate regions. And coming to our, our, our tropical region, the migration is not so that much popular, but seasonal migrations are observed. That means the, during the peak uh, uh, summer, the species that are the forest dependent species tends to move to the high elevation. and they will come down during the winter season. So such kind of altitudinal migration is reported. Apart from that, there is no uh, long distance migrated from the tropical regions. But but for the temperate region, there are like long distance migration. They they used to migrate like 2000 kilometers during this uh, seasons, between seasons. Indian flying fox in the country of Okay, the Indian flying fox, the recently the name changed to Tyropus medius. Uh, and several studies say that the, the roosting site of Tyropus medius is large standing trees. And these particular species are not even, uh, these particular species are not seen within the forest. Instead, they are like seen in the fringe areas as well as in the coastal regions. So cutting down of such large standing trees pose a severe threat and they roost in large numbers. So they tend to move to other places, which may be a territory of other, uh, I mean, the other group of Europus medias, which having a conflict. So planting, there are like many social, so, social, uh, social forestry activities. So planting such large, uh, large standing trees, I mean, uh, saplings of large standing trees would help this uh, flying fox in future. And they are also you know, reported for many of these uh, uh, carriers of many lethal uh, viruses. For example, the Nipah outbreak in, in Kerala, the bats that the Tyropus media that sampled from that region is also you know, having the presence of Nipah virus in their body. So such the large fruiting bats is also you know, known to be carriers of several diseases. And there are, you know, after this Nipah outbreak, the people were tend to uh, cut down these large standing trees or they started smoking under the trees to, to deprive these species or the individuals from their homestead, which is again posing severe threats. And, and the large fruit bats is again hunted by people, especially the indigenous people as a source of protein. So such activities should be stopped and take strict measurements. Again, these fruit bats are not listed in the Wildlife Protection Act and there is uh, some limitations from the forest department side to register cases against uh, hunting of Indian flying fox. Thank you, sir. Uh, we move on to the next question. It's from Annapurni from ATR Amravati. She wants to know if bats are friendly to humans. I say, like, I will say, like, they are friendly to me. Uh, I was working on the bats for several years, and and I never say like. You can say like the, bat, the other animals. Recently, there was an incident of elephant attack in Kerala, sloth bear attack in Kerala, leopard attack in Kerala. But you never seen of you know bat attack because bat they don't come and attack any of the humans. So there and and 
I don't know whether you remember when I when I showed a picture of the roasting sites. I show one picture of one house. That is my own house. I, there is a bat roast in. So we are living together for several years. So they are friendly, as I said, like they are friendly. As of all, like bats are very close to us, and maybe in your house as well, there will be some bat roasting in some you know the AC cleft or like you know under the clay tiles. You know there will be some species of bats or even like some species in some of the banana plantain or some trees there. So they are very close to us, but we are not noticing them. Thank you, Ms. Annapurni, for the question. Uh, Ms. Aparna wants to know if bats lactate like other mammals. Yes, of course. They are mammals. So they usually have mammary gland and they, they, can you see what this question? Okay, okay. So they used to lactate like other mammals. And, um, and for some species like the for the hypocytus and rhinophytes, they usually have another set of nipple, which is known as the pubic nipple, and which allows this pup, I mean the young one of the bat, to bite this pubic nip and hang on the mother body while they are in the flight. So they have nipples as well as the pubic nipples in some species. They they lactate. And they usually, you know, they carry their pup for two to three weeks afterwards they will leave their pup in their roost because they will get mature and the body weight of the pup will also increase so it will be make difficult for the mother to carry their pup so they will leave the pup in the in the colony or the roost and they will go for uh, for foraging after coming back they will feed on the pup they will identify exactly the same pup based on their smell thank you for the question aparna we'll move on to the next question uh, miss anindita wants to know if you can talk a bit about the conservation status of bats in India and what are the gaps? So that is one of the slides which are talking about the, the conservation challenges. Like very few people are currently working on the bats. So we need more people. So for that, we need to have trained experts. We need to have regional echolocation called library. We need to have proper sampling techniques. We need to have periodic trainings. And finally, more important is the, the fundings. So, so for now, like there are like few funding agencies that fund for the bad research. So we need to find more funding agencies to come up with good uh, research proposals and good research. Thank you for the question, ma'am. A participant wants to know why bats avoid and hate reflective objects like mirror. Yes, uh, so as I said, like many of the bat species, they used to produce echolocation sound and they want to get these reflected waves for identifying their object, their path and the prey. So such smooth surface may deflect, instead of reflecting the, uh, the echolocation calls, they will deflect in some other direction, which, which makes some confusion for in their in their path or the direction at the moment. That's why they are avoiding such such smooth surfaces. Thank you. We'll move on to the next question. Yeah, yeah, Uttam, uh, uh, Doctor Uttam. Sorry, another uh, addition, the Meghalaya state government was recently uh, declared the community reserve exclusively for the conservation of autonomous property, possibly the first protected area set up in the conservation of the bats. Happy to inform that I was a part of. Oh, great. Yeah. So autonomous property was previously considered as an, uh, as an endangered, I mean, uh, endemic to the Western Guards, but now the, the distribution is again, we found from the southeast, uh, northeastern part of India towards the Southeast Asia. Yeah, and it is happy to see that there is one protected area in India, in Meghalaya, yeah, in 2020, a couple of years back, there is one declared as a community reserve. Yeah, thank you, Uttam, for the updates. So I noted the, uh, wait one second, uh, there is one email address which I asked. Uh, yeah, also noted that, I will share that paper with you. Participants, please 
feel free to unmute your audio and ask in questions. You can also use the hand raise option. I repeat, kindly unmute your audio to ask any questions. Okay, that is one more question from the Venu. What is the thermal imaging equipment or monocular binocular used? The thermal imaging equipment they can be used especially for the warm blooded animals and uh, just for monitoring the presence or absence of animals. So we are using it in the caves, especially for uh, seeing the presence of bats inside the caves, as well as uh, it can be used for counting the number of individuals. So which is a bit expensive equipment uh, and uh, not many researchers are using that, the thermal imaging equipment. But instead the forest department is using some of this equipment for monitoring the presence of elephants in the night while they are uh, patrolling. Thank you, sir. Mr. Saravanan, you can unmute your audio and ask your question. Mr. Saravanan, you can unmute your audio and ask the question. Thank you. We can move on to the next question. I think Verna's question is the last one. Is there any more questions? Participants, if anyone wants to speak, you can unmute and talk. Thank you. One participant raised hands. Can we allow them to speak? Mr. Saravanan, kindly unmute. Mr. Saravana, you raise your hand, so kindly unmute yourself and ask the question, please. Otherwise, I think it's an accident. Yeah. Okay, there is uh, one question by Pavitra. Why bats are prone to rapid viral mutations and infections? Or, <laughs> yeah, this is again, uh, what do you say, like coexistence and the evolutionary characteristics of, from the bat side. And uh, due to, you are aware about the bat activity. So, so they are very active during the night. That means they are spending a lot of energy uh, every day and, and their respiration rates keeps on increasing, like at least like, 10 times more than the usual respiratory rate and the blood circulation keeps on increasing, which are you know, help, helping this immune system uh, more vibrant and keeping such pathogens inactive in the body, in the state of their body. But once the pathogens spill over from the bad body, it will, you know, it will express and having uh, you know, negative impact on other animals. And many of the pathogens are you know, uh, getting uh, uh, are coexisted. I mean, it's uh, it's co not not even coexisted. Coevolution. There's such disease got coevolution happened along with the bats, and many of these at least like 64, 65 species of 65 pathogens or the virus are so far isolated from the bat's body. And yeah. Thank you, sir. Now we move on to the uh, vote of thanks. On behalf of AIWC family, I thank you for sparing some of your valuable time to enlighten us about these amazing creatures. 
you with your visit to the zoo with our with your students we appreciate that despite of the time constraints you have managed to educate us on this topic it was really interesting to know about the techniques the bats use in trans echolocation and uh, and also about their significance to be conserved it was very informative thank you thank you very much we thank all the participants for being wonderful audience we hope you find this useful and finally i thank the aiwc team for successfully conducting the webinar and running it smoothly throughout also i like to extend my thanks to kamba team and aazp zoo team for helping us live stream the webinar on youtube thank you so much everyone do check out our official aiwc website for more such webinars in the future you may now leave the meeting thank you